Today I'm going to show you how to get one of the best N64 emulators available to date set up and running on your PCs and by extension your Asus ROG Ally or Lenovo Legion Go etc because guess what those are just PCs. <laughs> The emulator we're looking at today is Simple64. It is a parallel based emulator and has great accuracy and is a very authentic way to experience N64 with a number of cool extras, including being able to use real N64 controllers with a RAFNET adapter and have them behave just like real N64s and the expansion port working with rumble packs, controller packs, and even the transfer pack. The emulator also fully supports the VRU for Hey You Pikachu and is really simple to get set up. Thus the name, Simple64, and again, highly accurate. So let's go ahead and dive in. So the first thing we're going to do is get Simple64 downloaded onto our PCs. So Simple64 is available for Windows and Linux, but again, today's tutorial is covering Windows only. So head to the Simple64 website, which is linked down below, and click on the Download Emulator button. And that'll bring you to the latest GitHub release, and you can just download simple64win64.zip. Once Simple64 is downloaded, just go ahead and get it extracted to any folder you desire. For today's demo, we are using the desktop for ease of access and demonstration. So if you have an emulation folder, just go ahead and plop it in there, and awesome. But anyway, I'm just going to open this up. Inside, we have a Simple64 folder. I'm just going to move that to the desktop so we don't have to go through two subfolders here. But anyway, opening up the Simple64 folder, we have... A lot of folders and files and good stuff like that, but to launch Simple64, we just need to go down to simple64-gui.exe. And once it finishes loading up, you're going to be brought to a Simple64 menu that looks just like this. Now, before we add any games and stuff, there are some settings that I recommend changing if you want to have a truly portable type of experience. So the first thing we're going to do is set up some directories so that way everything will save into our Simple64 folder because by default it goes into your Windows roaming folder and that's not ideal for easy backup and access to your files. So first thing we're going to do is head up into settings, input plugin and core config path selection. So config directory path. So we're going to tell it to use the application path and this is one of those reasons why you want to make sure you have the folder placed where you want it to stay before starting to configure it. So just tell it to use the application path. And once set, just go ahead and close out of Simple64 and then launch back in. Now under settings, go to core and video settings. So there's a number of options in here that we can talk about more in a little bit, but the ones that we're most interested in are our save state path and SRAM path and shared data path. Well, I mean, that one's less important, but whatever. So anyway, Within our Simple64 folder, go ahead and make a couple new folders such as save states, saves, and if you're really into screenshots, um, let's see here, screenshots, and then you can make a new shared data folder as well. All right, there we go. Actually, for simplicity, I'm going to get rid of any spaces in these ones. So we're going to simplify these names real quick. So there we go. And it help if I actually uh, type the name correctly. Gotta love it. There we go. Excellent. All right, now back in Simple64, we're going to add in the directories for each of these four folders. So the easiest way to get this information, just right-click on it, Properties, and copy the location. And then you can paste it into each of these four folders. Now we just need to add another forward slash. Wrong one and then type in the name of each folder. So for screenshots, I just named that one screenshots. Save states, let's see here. We just named that one states. Save SRAM path, we named that one saves. And then for the shared data path, we named that one data. And there we go. So now we can go ahead and close out of that menu. And I'm just gonna restart the program once again to make sure all the changes took effect. And sure enough, there they are. And with that, all of our directory settings are now ready to go. So let's talk about getting our controller set up for initial use. So I'm gonna go ahead and cover two controller methods here for you. So first up, we're using an 8-bit Doe Ultimate Controller. So just got that plugged in. So going into settings, controller configuration, controller one, and then there's controller two, three, four. You can do this with all the controllers. But you can just select your controller from the menu here. 
And then you can select between memory pack, rumble pack, and transfer pack, or none. So I'm just gonna select rumble for now. But we need to choose a profile. So it's set to auto by default. If you wanna make your own controller profile, just click on the manage profiles tab here. And you can set a new profile for keyboard or gamepad. We're gonna make one for the gamepad here. And we're gonna name it uh, standard. And then from here, you can just go ahead and map the buttons as you see fit. So let's go ahead and do this, do that. D-pads. C-buttons. Control stick up, control stick down. And there we go, and then we can adjust dead zone sensitivities and all that good stuff. And so once set, just hit save and close. And there you go, you now have a new controller profile you can use, so we're just gonna set it to standard. And our controller is now ready to go with this 8 Ultimate Wireless Controller. Now, if you are using the Asus ROG Ally, let's go ahead and go over how to set that up. So we're inside Simple64 once again, but you can open up your side window here and make sure that your control mode is set to gamepad. Now just go ahead and click on your settings tab up here. Now click on controller configuration. Under the gamepad, just go ahead and select the Xbox 360 controller. And now we'll go back over to Manage Profiles, New Profile Gamepad, and then just set the controls as you see fit. So just tap on them and then set your pad. And then again, you can set dead zone configuration and stick ranges here as you see fit. So I'm just going to set it to 1% for my ROG ally. Oh, and we forgot to type in a name here. Here we go. And there we go. Save and close. Controller tab 1. Set it to default and all set for controls using our ROG ally's built-in controller. Now again, one of the greatest things about Simple64 is it can use the RAFNET N64 controller adapters to give access to real controllers with their real performance and accessories. So if you head over to the RAFNET website, there's a couple available. So there's a dual N64 controller to USB adapter, which is the one I'm using in today's demo. It's unfortunately out of stock as of this recording. So check back and check stock levels as you, uh, as you desire. But right now the single plug-in one is available and it runs for $24.49. But once you get your RAFNET adapter, just get it plugged into your PC with the included uh, mini USB cable here. So it just looks something like that. And then you've got the one or two N64 controller ports that uh, came with the adapter of your choice. So I have mine here. So I'm just going to figure out which one of these is port one again here. Sorry. I'm just going to get my N64 controller plugged in. And there we go. Now that everything's hooked up, I'm just going to restart Simple64 to make sure everything's getting detected. But anyway... Under the settings tab, input plugin and config path selection. We're gonna change the input plugin from simple64 input-qt.dll to simple64 input rafnetdll And with that set, if you click on the settings tab, you'll see that the controller configuration is now grayed out because it is a literal one-to-one -one mapping to your N64 controller. You don't have to change any settings. In addition to controller settings, it's also worth noting that you can change hotkey configurations. It has a bunch of default mappings that are assigned to your keyboard and you can change these up as you see fit with your keyboard. So just go through these and change them up as desired. Now with our directory settings and controllers configured, we're ready to launch into our first N64 game. So for our N64 games, they can be in .z64, .n64, the typical N64 ROM formats, but you are going to need to source these ROMs yourself. So you can rely on Google to do such things. But if you happen to have a large physical collection of N64 games that you wish to dump and back up saves to add to your Simple64 emulation projects, there's two devices that I have personally used and can recommend with ease. The first one is the Joey64 from Bin Vin. This is a very simple N64 cartridge dumper. Plug your cartridge into it, plug it in, and you will see the ROM file and save file like on a flash drive, and you can just transfer it over to your PC. And if you're interested in seeing a video of the process, I do have a video guide on how to do so with the Ben Ven Joey 64. If you're interested, link will be in the description below. 
Now the second device is the Retro Blaster Programmer and Dumper. So this is the new mini version that just came out not too long ago. And this one is a bit more expensive than the Joey 64, but it also offers a ton more functionality, especially since it can do multiple cartridges, but you do have to get the adapters for each one. But this one runs around $65 and then you could get all the cartridge adapters as well. So those are unfortunately sold separately, but as you can see, they go for about six to $10. And again, it offers just a lot more functionality for the Retro Blaster over the Joey 64. And once again, the Retro Blaster lets you easily back up N64 ROM images as well as save games from your cartridges. And I do have a video tutorial with the older Retro Blaster on how to do so. So it's gonna be the same steps minus the voltage switch. You don't have to worry about that crap. But again, link to this video will be in the description below. Or, you know, if you want to be weird, you could always go for that N64 Game Shark backup method if you have an old Windows 98 PC, and we still have that legacy video up and live on the channel if you're interested. So three methods of backing up your N64 games and saves. But with all that said, do not ask me for ROM links because they will not be provided. But after you've acquired your N64 games to load them up in Simple64, just click on File, Open ROM, navigate to the folder where your N64 games are stored, then from here, just go ahead and select a game and it will boot right up. And so here we are within Simple64 playing our first N64 game. So I just chose Command Conquer 64 for the heck of it, why not? But anyway, as you can see, it's a little uh, less than ideal in our video settings and this is something that we could change after we confirm that everything's working. We just wanna make sure everything's set up and our controls are working, so. All good on that front. But anyway, so to change our video settings, you just head up to the settings tab, core and video settings. So a couple things here to make note of. If you want to disable the expansion pack, there's a disable extra memory button within the core tab here. So if you click this off, the expansion pack will be disabled. But to change our video settings, we're gonna go to the parallel video tab here. And so the first thing we're gonna check is the full screen video tab. And if you want to upscale your N64 games, you can change the upscaling factor here. And I believe that the values you could choose are one, two, four. Don't quite remember off the top of my head. So I like to use four on my RTX 3080. Now, if you start getting a lot of screen tearing, you can enable V-Sync. And if you want to stretch your games into widescreen if they're anamorphic or if you just like stretching your games out like some sort of heathen, there is a widescreen stretch option right here. But once we have our settings set, we can just go ahead and close out of our game. So I'm just going to tell it to stop there. We're going to open it back up. And now when we reload back into Command & Conquer here, you can see that it is far more pretty to look at graphically than it did back at native resolutions, but the native resolution is actually pretty darn accurate, so it's pretty cool to see regardless. So for those of you that love upscaling your games, there you go. You can also use this moment to check to make sure our saves are saving where they're supposed to, so I'm just gonna make a quick save here in Command & Conquer. I'm gonna exit out of the emulation. And check my simple 64 save folder and hey look at that command and conquer save going into our simple 64 folder as we wanted all right now one more video option i want to cover is our deinterlacing method so by default simple 64 uses bob deinterlacing which results in a jumpy video like you see here in rogue squadron so going back into that settings menu core and video settings parallel video tab you can enable a weave deinterlacing process here. And then we'll just reset the emulation once again to make that take effect. And with weave in effect, you can see that it is no longer jumpy and bouncy, but there are some disadvantages to weave deinterlacing as well, as I will show just in a second. So with weave deinterlacing, you may notice that there are tears in different assets in 480i titles. So you can see with the pro droids here, they kind of look a little fuzzy. And that's just to be expected. So you can either have things be jittery or have lines through them. So your preference, your choice, just go ahead and use whatever you think looks best in your opinion. Honestly, when you upscale it this much, the lines aren't as noticeable in my opinion. So weave has always kind of been my go-to with the parallel video backend. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and cover the rest of the video settings available to us with the parallel video. So we have super scaled reads, and this will basically super scale some buffer effects that are in the N64 hardware. It can cause visual glitches, so that's why it's off by default, but you can mess with it on and see what you think. Super scaled dithering and synchronous RDP are on by default, recommend leaving them there. You can crop over scan on your emulated image if there's garbage data on the sides of the screen you want to get rid of. You can stretch the image vertically, so if you are doing a letterbox widescreen game for example you can uh, essentially give it a widescreen stretch then vertical stretch it to make it fill your 16 by 9 monitor better now these next few effects are all for video features that were in the n64 chip so for example if you want to get rid of the dithering anti-aliasing and things like that you can really make a very sharp n64 output Anyway, next up we have a downscaling factor here. So after up our game, we could downscale it back towards something more like native resolution to give us some pretty interesting effects. So for example, we could just type a two here. And so with that downscale factor set to two, you can see that we are now once again looking a little bit more pixelated, but but still a lot more clarity in the image than you would get out of native N64 rendering. So it's again, pretty cool effect, so. A lot of use cases for it if you use a lot of post-processing effects and things like that. So definitely fun to mess with. But I'm just going to go ahead and turn this back to zero to disable it. And it's also worth noting that on any of these boxes, as long as you click on them, you can just kind of hover over their name and it'll tell you the current options that are available and what they do. No, it kind of took a long time to mention that, but there we go. Next up, native texture level of detail. So Parallel kind of uses the highest MIP maps available for a lot of things, so if you want to have a more N64 accurate experience, you could turn on native texture level of detail. And then go ahead and restart your emulation to see what kind of effect that has. So in GoldenEye here, you can see that the ground textures itself have become a lot more muddy, a lot closer to our camera with this option enabled. And as we move forward, it just kind of resolves into the clarity that we get closer to the camera. So a little bit more authenticity and accuracy to the real N64 experience, but definitely not one that's going to look pretty when you are up your games. So for a good majority of you, I imagine you're just going to leave this one off and call it a day. And again, just a quick example of what it looks like with that option disabled. So you can see a lot more detail in our ground textures regardless of how close the camera is. And now our last option, native text direct, leave that one on, it fixes misaligned sprites in a good number of games. All right, now let's talk about transfer pack emulation. So Simple64 has a nice built-in transfer pack feature if you're using standard Xbox 360 or other modern PC type controllers. So to use the transfer pack, first thing we're gonna do is go into our controller configuration here, we're going to select the pack to transfer. Now under our file menu here, you'll see a Game Boy cartridges selection here. So all you have to do is set your ROM file and your save file for your game in question. So we have chosen Pokemon Red. And then for my save file, I chose my Retro Achievement save file. And the saves need to be in .sav format. So if you're using RetroArch for Game Boy emulation or something, you just need to change the extension to .sav. And then you can do the same things for player two, player three, and player four. But now we can just go ahead and open up our Pokemon Stadium ROM. And there we go. You can see there that my retro achievement save has been detected by the emulator. And we can now do all the fun things like go to the Pokemon lab, put in our cartridge, and manage our save files and things like that. So here we go, we'll take a look at my Pokemon real quick. So there we go. You can see my party has some interesting people in it at the moment. But then you can just go through, navigate, and do all the stuff you would normally do. Now, unfortunately, I don't believe the Game Boy Tower works. We'll try it out real quick. So yes, unfortunately, doing the emulated transfer pack, the Game Boy Tower does not work. Now, if you are using the RafNet adapter, you can use physical transfer packs and physical Game Boy games 
in all supported titles, and this is very simple. You just do it like a real N64. Just pop out a Rebel pack. Yikes. Slap in a transfer pack, and you're good to go as long as you have that RaftNet adapter selected as your input option. So with all of that in place, again, just make sure you have the RaftNet adapter selected as your plug-in. And then just go ahead and open up Pokemon Stadium. And it might be finicky at first, that's to be expected. You could just try to load it up again. There we go. And there is my physical copy of Pokemon Red being detected by the game. And this is the one I turned into a Mew distribution cart a couple of years ago for a video. And this one just boots right up into the Game Boy Tower. It might take a while for it to actually load the game. It's a bit slow, unfortunately. But there it is, Game Boy Tower working within N64 emulation with a real N64 controller transfer pack and copy of Pokemon Red. And things speed up quite a bit once it actually finishes loading. There we go. So as you can see, it's a lot better now. But we could just go in here and confirm that this is the actual save file from my physical game. And there we go. Yes, it is. All my Mews and the one Magnemite I traded to the cartridge for the Mew distribution event. And it all saves and works just as you expect on real hardware. So it's pretty seamless and actually really cool. And for all of your games that switch between rumble packs or controller packs, it's pretty much going to be the same deal. Under controller configuration, if you're using the standard input, under the pack tab, you can change between memory and rumble as necessary. If you're using the RafNet plugin, you could just physically swap to the packs needed as they are needed. Now let's move on to VRU emulation. So for this one, we need to emulate it. So change over to the simple 64 input dash QT.dll. Get your normal controller plugged in. Under settings, controller configuration, head over to the controller 4 tab and choose for gamepad emulate VRU. And it will download a voice model and get it extracted. And once that's set, you can just go ahead and close out of it. And then make sure you have a microphone plugged into your Windows PC and it is selected as your default device. But then you can just go ahead and open up the Hey You Pikachu ROM. The game will boot because it detects the VRU. But now we can test it out. Pikachu. Pikachu. So then it just wants you to say something to Pikachu. Pika. 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 And there we go. All right, now let's talk about cheat codes. So there is a cheats tab under the emulation menu that activates once you have a game enabled. So you can click on the cheats tab here. And a number of pre-existing cheats should be auto-populated. If not, you can enter your own custom cheats down below. So for example, let's go ahead and enable that one real quick. And then we just have to restart the game for things to take effect. So just, all right, so here we go. Now we can test it by holding L to levitate. So there we go, the cheat works as expected. And uh, it can be quite humorous. Let's just fly over this uh, tunnel here, shall we? Ah, uh, yeah. 
All right, now let's finally go over the Netplay option. Simple64 has a built-in Netplay server, so clicking on the Netplay tab, you can create a room or join a room. So under the Create tab, you can enter your room name, password, select the game you want to play, and then enter in your player name and then a server. So there's Europe West, South America, US East, US West, and then a custom option, and then you can create the game. Or if you're going to be the client, you just click on Join Room, select your server, and then the listed games that are available will populate inside the window here. So I created a test room named Ice Tests on my Asus ROG Ally for Super Smash Brothers. So I'm just gonna go ahead and join this room. My password protected it just to be safe. Oh, here we go. And then I'm gonna select my Super Smash Brothers ROM. And one thing I forgot to mention is you do need to enter a player name up here. There we go. But just going to join that room again. And then you'll be brought into the Netplay lobby here, and you can type in messages and all this other stuff. And then once you're all set, you can just start the game. Well, player one could start the game. There we go. All right, so here we are in the Netplay screen. So we got both players going at once here. And just play it over the internet seamlessly. It's pretty friggin' awesome, not gonna lie. And honestly, it doesn't feel too bad as far as lag's concerned. Only about 30 ms, so not bad. And there you have it, Simple64 setup running upscaling, controls, transfer packs, VRU, and net play, everything you could ever desire out of this emulator. It's all ready to go and very easy to accomplish. Again, Simple64 is one of the best ways to emulate Nintendo 64 games if you want to have an experience that is more true to the original hardware, but still gives you the added bonuses of up and different things like that. Now, unfortunately, Simple64 won't work with a number of older Mario 64 ROM hacks or ROM hacks built on older video plugins, but anything that works on a real N64 is going to work here. I'm also hoping that someday we could see retro achievement integration because that is the only thing that is stopping me from using this emulator exclusively. But I hope this video has helped you get your simple 64 setup needs handled and just enjoy playing N64 games. Here at the end, just the couple usual favors to ask if you don't mind. Hit that thumbs up, thumbs down button depending on how much you like this tutorial and then that sub button and notification bell so you can see when new videos go live on the channel. Loads of content coming your way, and I appreciate having you all along for the ride. For anyone interested in further helping support the channel and keep it going, you can also check out that join button here on YouTube or the Patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Every little bit helps keep this place going and bringing more content just like this to each and every one of you. Big shout out to all of our current backers, thank you so much again for always believing in what we do here and helping us keep it going. You're amazing. But until next time, my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome, keep on gaming, and we'll see you back next video.